Hi, I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my everyday life living in Latin America. I'm an expat full-time and have been for a long time, about 10 years now. And today I was, uh, one, I'm kind of hiding in the office because I had some major work done to my knee last night. I know you guys have been watching, you're like, wasn't your knee doing a lot better? Yeah, it was. And then they decided it was doing really well, and they had to take a razor blade to it and, and take the entire, it's in so much pain. And now I have a new wrist thing is just uncomfortable and this is going to be going on for days yet. So I'm not wanting to go outside. Plus we've got some rain starting and it's election day that I'm uh, doing this. So I'm just kind of hiding in my office. Everyone's feeling a little bit the weight of the world and I'm gonna today touch on a CNN travel article. Uh, too much grief and no joy. This couple plans to return to the US after their dream life in France becomes a nightmare. Right after that bump. So we've done a number of recaps on this show in the past where we've talked about people who've moved to Nicaragua, normally where we've spoken to them previously, have some background, know what's going on, and are able to kind of dig into what went wrong with their move and why relocating to a new country didn't work for them and the mistakes that they made. And uh, this is going to be kind of like that, but we're going to be looking at someone we don't know personally, but they made a CNN travel article about them, about a failed move. And I, oh, we just lost one of my lights. It shows how I need to keep these things charged more often. And uh, we're going to uh, dig into their move and see what went wrong. Because just reading this article, it's really easy to see that this couple was not prepared in any way for making a move to any foreign country. The fact that it was France is completely irrelevant to their story. So I want to dig into this article a little bit and just help you guys uh, understand. I just do something a little bit different today. Hope you enjoy uh, the change of pace. And uh, we didn't have any specific user questions. User? Well, it shows I'm at the office right now. We have a viewer questions right now uh, that anyone's looking to have answered and so it's a perfect time to just jump into something a little bit different and get this done. So let's get right into the article. Okay so in this article they move this couple who is uh, 74 and 75 so they're most likely retired. They're looking at a very different uh, plan than most people. I mean that's pretty old to be moving to a new country. Um, moving to France I think comes with um, a certain amount of, you moved to the most obvious country. If you say, you know, you're an American, you want to move abroad. Sure, if you're watching my channel, you, you tend to have one kind of view of the world. And a lot of you might say, well, the knee-jerk reaction might be a Mexico, uh, maybe a Costa Rica. Um, but pretty quickly, you would say there's very few people who don't traditionally have the Spains, the Frances, the Italys on their radar. Maybe a Greece. Right. And, and trust me, these are countries that not France, but most of these countries are ones that I have lived in and put in a lot of time because I absolutely love them. I seriously consider them for relocation as places I certainly considered raising my family. France was on our radar, just wasn't one of the ones that I spent time in uh, in that context. And uh, so what we have here very likely now we're, we're definitely Monday morning quarterbacking is people who were going with a knee-jerk reaction. We traveled, we saw some ritzy place that is perfect when we're on vacation, and we didn't think about what life would be like there. We only thought about how beautiful it is when you're seeing the sights. That's very likely. When you're talking about people moving to places like France, these are people who watched Emily in Paris on Netflix. These are people who didn't actually do any critical thinking, people who have not done a lot of evaluation. I'm not saying they haven't traveled, but we talk about this a lot, and I have a video that was recorded a few days ago, but it's, it's, it hasn't come out yet, where we talk about the, the overall approach to when you're looking for a country that you need to be looking at uh, a place you want to live, not a place you want to travel. And when you go to someplace like France, because it is a world travel destination, because it's so likely that you went there as a tourist, it's almost a guarantee, just mathematically speaking, it's going to be the case that you probably are looking at moving there because you liked visiting and not visiting for the purpose of evaluating a move. And so this is a high failure rate country. Nicaragua, very unlikely do you come to Nicaragua because you want to see its famous sites and, and, then, and then end up moving. People who move to Nicaragua are generally doing so intentionally because it's very much off the beaten path. A lot of effort goes into dissuading people from going to it. Lots of reasons. Places like Nicaragua tend to have high success rates with expats simply because the expats who are moving there are almost always people who've 
taken the effort to, to really think it through and they know what they're doing. And places like France tend to struggle because they get so many people, same with Costa Rica, so many people go without doing due diligence. Oh, I heard about it in CNN Travel Magazine. I read about it in Condé Nast Traveler. I saw it in an ad on an airport, uh, an airline magazine. So I thought we would move. And I didn't know anything about what life there would be really like. I didn't think it through. I didn't evaluate. I didn't really, you know, and that's exactly what I would anticipate here. They don't know that, but that kind of stuff. When you're looking at articles like this, this is something to think about that places like France, um, you, you just get a lot of these people that imagine they're going to be on permanent vacation. And you're, they're retired, I think, so they kind of are on permanent vacation, uh, but you have to live your real life too. And I think we're going to see that in the article. So this, so another thing, so the second thing, we gave it a year, uh, Joanna says, she's the, one of the, 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 the older member of the couple, um, and we said it was just too much grief and no joy. There's no fun, we're struggling every day. Wow, how do you end up in that position? Right, that's, but okay, so after one year, they gave it one year. Now I understand they're 75. You don't want to give it a ton of time to make your decision. So I get that. But when moving to a new country, you re, when moving, not testing, like we talk about this, when you're actually moving, you need to give yourself time. You need to have time to settle in, really get to know what you're doing and, and maybe go back and forth. And uh, um, one year feels like, you're barely testing the waters realistically for a long-term move. Um, how, how could you really learn enough about your community in one year to really know? Uh, maybe you can start adjusting for sure, but to actually give up on the country you've chosen to live in in just one year feels pretty extreme. Uh, she says, now this I think is going to come back to bite her. I honestly don't think we could have put in any more effort to acclimatize to the French way of life, she adds, who describes their experience as a nightmare. Um, while they're working out their finer details of their imminent return, they said they were uh, frustrated and exhausted by life in France and ready to give up and leave. Apparently they are still there, but just about to head back. They originally come from San Francisco and they had moved to the city of Nimes. Uh, they've been married for 20 years. They say that they have traveled the world extensively, both together and beforehand. However, a lot of people travel extensively and what they mean is taking package tours, going on cruises, uh, going to see the sites of Europe where you're staying in fancy hotels and such and so forth. And these are things that we don't know about this couple, but when you're reading articles like this, it's good to think about, is that what they mean? Is that what they, is that their concept of experience? Or is it that they actually went to these places, put in lots of time, lived there? You get very different uh, responses. You could spend your whole life traveling and not be prepared to move to a new place any more than someone who had never traveled at all. Maybe a little bit more, but barely more. It doesn't really do that much to prepare you for moving uh, just by having traveled to a number of places. Now, they did point out they have no kids, no siblings, no parents. They are completely unencumbered. They do have a pet, but many of you do, and we all know how that is, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, Joanna explains that they bought and sold several different homes. They saved up some cash in the U.S., so they were really financially set to be able to travel. Uh, they've been living in California for quite some time uh, at this point. They also made this comment, which is kind of interesting, and I kind of agree with this. I think every married couple needs two places to live, because you've got to get away from each other, <laughs> adds Joanna, who previously worked as a healthcare executive. Uh, that's kind of true. Um, you know, my wife and I, we've been together for 23 years, longer than this couple, and um, while we don't normally maintain maintain residences apart. We do maintain multiple residences and from time to time it's very nice that we, you know, we have an apartment up the street, we have uh, places on the beach. We are able to go and spend time away from each other very easily. Almost never do that. We also have a large house and can spend our time across the house from each other all day and even though we both work from home, uh, it's not that much that we interact unless we intend to go see each other. Uh, we also sometimes travel separately from each other. So I get, I get the point and, and uh, she may be correct. I don't know if having a house in, in California and a house in France and going to them separately is exactly what you want to do. We're just 12 minutes away if we're going to do that, you know, and it's like, ah, oh, I feel like being on the beach tonight. I just want to stay with the kids and play video games tonight. Okay, cool. We'll do our things. <laughs> Not, um, you know, what? I feel like I'm going to go to France for the season and I'll see you later. But when you get 
into retirement age, and especially if you've been married 30, 40 years, easy to see that happening. And, um, you know, I did my Bolivia trip without her. She did her Cambodia trip without me. And uh, we're, we're perfectly capable of getting some time to ourselves um, as well. Uh, she does uh, point out they are very political people, and they're one of the reasons that they are moving abroad as they wanted to get away from the political climate in the U.S., which totally makes sense. However, I don't think they researched where they were going very well. They went to a place whose political climate, I don't want to say is as bad as the U.S., but is more like the U.S. than not on the world stage. It is not dramatically different and is going through many of the same growing pains, changes, influxes, whatever, however you want to look at it, that the U.S. is going through right now. So I find the particular places that they were they were considering to be, um, which in 2011, they actually made a move to London, um, and then now, just, just last year, uh, made a um, move to, to Paris. They kind of threw in this London thing and in, in, in just kind of hid it in there. And they're going to all the most expensive locations. So this is not people being frugal, right? Not very likely to be my audience. I know some of you are not looking to be frugal. That is not everybody. Um, but I do, you know, being in Nicaragua, we tend to get a lot of frugal people. But um, uh, they're very much uh, focused on a very small area of very, very rich Europe. Um, and coming from San Francisco, of course, you tend to be like that, right? They're, you're just coming from the most expensive places uh, that tend to be very big, isolated cities where you're much less likely to get out um, and get to know people. Uh, but they decided they couldn't live in the UK anymore. They could not afford it, which is pretty shocking to then move to France. Um, but So all of these, uh, the US, UK, and France, are all relatively close politically. Um, on the world stage, they're bordering on identical. Uh, that's pushing the point a little bit. The United States is extremely far in one direction and no one goes that far. But the UK and France do lean far more towards it than other places. So um, even from, and, and we've seen this in other conversations of people who make the claim that they're leaving uh, wherever they're going from and, and making the choice of where they're moving to for political reasons. And then the choice that they make very clearly points to them not having researched the politics at all. And which points out the point that I often make that it doesn't actually matter, right? Politics of the place you're moving to because you're not a citizen don't matter. The results matter, but the actual politics absolutely can't matter. They would be, there's no honest way to say that they do. You may just kind of have a accidental religious belief about politics. That's pretty unhealthy. No one should have that. But especially in the U.S., we tend to look at politics religiously and not politically, and Americans tend to actually mistake politics for religion. That's what would have to happen. If you go to another country and you're worried about their politics, it's because you actually confused it with religion, and it's not a religion that you uh, were interested in. Politics, you can't be interested in. You're not in the polity. So that's a as Americans, it will take a bit for that to sink in, but that is why Americans seem so strange about politics around the world. It's because most places politics are politics, but in the United States, politics are actually religion to the majority of people. Um, and if you've ever heard someone say something like, well, you can't do that because the Constitution, right? That's them saying that it's a religion to them because that means they're, they're demonstrating that to them the Constitution isn't a legal document to be controlled through the polity. It is a religious document that you must adhere to. They're, they're uh, speaking of it as though it's the Bible because in their mind it is. They may not have consciously come to that point. It is presented that way intentionally for a lot of reasons. It helps maintain the status quo and uh, reduces violence in a country and a lot of things internally. Uh, but that that is why. So that this is some weirdness going on with their political motivations as far as their move goes. Um, and uh, so so that there's a number of things you can see leading up here. They're like, huh, they they don't seem to really have thought through why they're moving. I'm sure they like France, but it they they don't seem to have said, here's what I want to solve. Here's how I want to solve it. And who would best solve this and then come up with options? They seem to have said, I hear a lot of people say France, and it doesn't seem scary because it's a popular tourist destination, so moving to France must be a great idea. 
Now, I will, of course, uh, link the CNN article in the in the show description down there so you guys can read the article yourself and uh, follow along. Um, and as always, if you have questions, comments, anything, get down, even just to say hi really matters. And of course, if you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at the link buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That link's down below. Or we have channel membership uh, that'd be fantastic if you guys sign up for as well. So uh, just some ways you can help support the show in addition to watching this and watching the next episode as well, of course. Okay, so now the next thing that this couple did is they hired a relocation specialist to help them find an apartment to rent and start the process of applying for a long stay visa. Now this is one of the things that people moving should know is a little bit about the place you're moving to. Now I realize when you watch my channel, I'm like, just move. I say this all the time or also in places where you can do that really easily. France is not one of these places and you do need to do a little bit of research anywhere to know what you're getting into before you actually go to live. Uh, France is one that does require a bit of paperwork to do a long-term stay and this they found to be kind of challenging. Now one of the things you'll notice here is they hired a relocation specialist. I understand that I kind of am a relocation specialist so this is kind of Hippocratic. Uh, hip 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 I'm being a hypocrite Thank you. Um, a little bit to say that often relocation specialists uh, are a problem, but it's true. Um, you know, one of the things that I say a lot is, you know, I'm really not here to be hired. I'm here to make content. Um, and I love when people want to hire me or want to have my team help with things. Um, and maybe at some point that's something that we'll do. We, we, at, and, and we kind of do. Um, but I very much try to stay away from that. We definitely don't advertise it because we don't want to be in that business uh, because there's so many con artist in that business. And so we're, where we're helping with relocation when we do, we try to focus very heavily purely on, on, on basic advice, making connections, uh, and tours, of course. Tours are different. You want us to show you around and stuff. Love it. It's different than selling you this ephemeral, like, we're going to help you relocate. No, no, no. We're going to drive you around and tell you about places and show you things. That's a different thing, and it's just fun, and we do that stuff. Okay, so she says, uh, securing a visa proved to be complicated, um, and having their cat fly over from France cost about 5000 or five, uh, fly over to France, I'm sorry, cost about $5,000. That was very complicated, and that was actually much cheaper than I had to pay for my dogs to come. But um, so, so one of the things that uh, you noticed here, I think I just said it, that they, they brought their cat and, uh, oh, I for having all of their stuff sent over. In addition, that was, the cat was 5,000 alone, but uh, the visa was complicated and to have their stuff moved. So this is where I feel that we have uh, in both directions doing the wrong thing. They don't seem to have done their research before moving. So in some ways they're being very impetuous. And the thing that we always are, are harping on is you don't just bring all your stuff stuff, basically ever, but especially right away. If you're going to move someplace, wait, see what you actually need, bring only what makes sense. Often that's nothing or nearly not. I mean, it's always going to meet your laptop and your clothes and there's always going to be some things. But these are people who did exactly what we warn everyone not to do. They were not in France long enough to ever determine if they should bring their, their household possessions, their cat you have to bring, I'm never going to leave my animals behind. But Everything else is way too much. And so that really getting into a mindset here of um, kind of being the, the luxury travelers that aren't doing the, it's everything that we worry about with unprepared travelers. Now, smartly in this process, they held on to their apartment in San Francisco, so they didn't completely give everything up um, and jump in with no way back or anything like that, but they did make some pretty big leaps. You don't want to move all of your stuff. The cost of moving your stuff is just, it's so impractical. Um, it really would have been, I think, a lot more sensible to rent things that they need, buy what makes sense. If they really thought they were gonna be there, the cost of moving would be more than, I mean, who knows what they own, it just doesn't make sense, right? We, we go through this time and time again with people, and every time it seems, and I went through this too, that's why I have a storage unit full of stuff I don't use. It seems like, why would you rebuy things you already own? But rebuying new is cheaper than shipping old almost always. Now, this brings us to the most, I think, salient point here. And I know we say a lot, you're coming to Nicaragua, don't let not knowing the language hold you back. And I certainly mean that. And, and if you're moving to France, don't let not learning the language hold you back. But we are, so I want some context here. We're talking about 
a couple who moved to talk about how they have no, you know, no dependencies, no kids, no, you know, it's just the two of them hanging out in France. They have like unlimited time to enjoy France. They have nothing to do in France except for in fa enjoy the fact that they're in France. They've traveled to France a bit in the past. They lived in England where they, you know, do things in France all the time. And after a year of living there, then they state this. The fact that she struggled to pick up the language as Ed, her husband, has learned some French since they've been living there didn't help. So, and then she said, I've been so busy packing, unpacking, assembling furniture. We're talking about a year here, right? Okay. That I haven't really found time to hunker down and start learning French. She doesn't talk about that it's a struggle. Some people can't learn languages totally. I, this guy, terrible at it. Um, she admits, it's always on my list, but I just couldn't find the time. So earlier, I want to notice, uh, point out, she said there's nothing in her mind that she felt she could do to acclimate more to being in France. And now she says she doesn't speak French. Apparently, probably not Akatan either, which is actually the language spoken in Nimes. So... They've been there a year. She feels she's done the most she could possibly do, but she hasn't done what most of us would consider the first step, which is to start learning the language. And understandably, one year, you would not have a mastery of the language. But I can tell you that I have certainly found time in the last year to start learning French. And I at least have a Duolingo nine and a half level in it, taking it casually on the side while really learning Spanish which is certainly not enough to be having conversations in France or anything, but I'm also not living in France and I don't hear French spoken every day. Uh, the, the reality is they should have been on uh, French much earlier. They should have been studying it before they went, as soon as they knew that this was a place that they wanted to go. Anything that was going to be um, uh, the, a serious consideration, they really should have been looking at French, even casually. Duolingo, do it for free. We're not talking about spending money. I'm not talking about topping 15 minutes a day. I'm not talking about hiring a tutor. I'm just talking about, let's get the ball rolling, right? Enough that when you hit the ground, and always do this, never start your stuff after you're on the ground. If you're on the ground, you're busy, right? You're, you're distracted. But just before you go, you're all like, I'm getting ready, I'm so excited, I'm moving to a new country. Go on my Duolingo, make myself more ready for my new country, right? Every little bit helps. Don't wait, in most cases, very few places in the world, I don't even know of one, do you need to learn the language first? So don't let that hold you back. Doesn't matter if you're going to France, Thailand, Nicaragua, but definitely put in the effort and start the sooner you start, right? But that is a, that we're, we're cherry picking this one really obvious problem, but it really shows she's acting like they've put in the maximum possible effort. And, and had we decided what minimum possible effort was before reading this article, we would have said, well, you'd have to have started the language at least a few weeks before you went to the country. So I think we have to, through our own reading into this, define this as made zero, had not even a passing interest in acclimating or assimilating. No interest at all not something that came up. Then it says, although France is renowned for its famous cuisine, now I'll admit I'm not a huge fan of French cuisine. However, I am a big fan of baguettes and brie and, and that kind of stuff. I could, and I have spent time in France and I am perfectly capable of gaining weight there. Uh, she says she quickly came to the realization that she wasn't a huge fan of the food in the country. She's she says, yeah, but if you eat, want to eat brie and pâté, pastries and French bread all day long, but who eats like that? Well, Joanna, the French eat like that. That's why people move to France, is the Mediterranean diet and the amazing food of France. That is exactly why people move there. It's something a lot of us dream of eating all day long. Real people want to eat that way, and normal people with a passing knowledge of France before they move there, many people before they even travel there are aware that this is how the French eat, so should not be, one, surprised by that it's something you're going to want to adapt to, and is probably a reason you would want to go, but also, you shouldn't say, but who eats like that, that sounds like someone who hasn't acclimated at all because you're surrounded by people who eat that way. 
She says she eagerly looked forward to cooking meals in France beforehand, but says that she had problems finding quality pro produce to cook. You go to the supermarket and the produce is terrible, she says. Of course, they put up a picture of her with beautiful produce in the background in the supermarket, but okay. You pick up a piece of celery and it falls over. It's so limp. It's so old and so horrible. Who would eat this? Well, once again, Joanna, maybe you should acclimate a little bit to France because the French don't buy their produce in supermarkets. That's just not how it's done. Now, I haven't lived in France, but I have spent a bit of time there. I've also lived on either side of it in Italy and Spain, and something that I know very well, the same as here in Nicaragua, we don't go to the supermarket for produce. You can in a pinch, it's not wrong to do so, but it is not culturally how it's done. For those of us who have acclimated or assimilated in any particular fashion, know that you go to the produce markets, you go to a greengrocer. Now, she lived in the UK for a while, she should be used to this, this is the same way that the UK works, and there's many parts of the US that work this way as well, but granted, not the majority. But you're expected to go to a place and get your bread and your veggies and your fruit and all that stuff in separate little shops. In the majority of the French-speaking world, that is how it works. And it's one of the glories of life in France is wandering to these little shops and picking up the incredible selection of fresh produce and such. And it's really cheap. It's great. It's a wonderful system. But if you're going to the supermarket trying to recreate your American life, then you may find that it's going to be a little bit lackluster. So once again, this is a very, very basic, how do you go about doing things in this town in southern France? And she was not at all prepared for it. After a year, she's being interviewed in an article as if she hasn't really been in France more than a week. Uh, according to her, her enthusiasm wavered considerably at the beginning of this year, which was about two months after they arrived, uh, when they tried to arrange for their car, which they'd left behind in San Francisco, to be transported to France. Seriously? You brought not just other things, you tried to bring a car? We talk about the insanity of bringing a car from the United States to Nicaragua. For those who haven't done your research, that's just driving it down a long road. One road, US 35, comes right by my house here in Nicaragua. This is not, ah, shipping a car to Europe? Do you realize that the cars are half the price in Europe starting with, and they're better cars? What is wrong with these people? This is like, these people have to be doing LSD daily in San Francisco to think that this is madness. I just, so frustrating. Like, they've been in France for two months and they still thought this was an acceptable idea. And they talked to a relocation consultant? They, they must have seen them coming. Like, this is crazy. I can't believe that CNN would put these people in an article to mock them like this. Ah, uh, she said, I read so many things that said, yes, do it, or no, don't do it. It's a nightmare. Um, did you just put your brain into this? You don't need to read anything. You'd have to be a moron to ship it to Europe like that. Nicaragua's different. It's close. It's still a bad idea, but it's, it's plausible, right? It's within the realm of reason. I know people who've done it. Once in a while, they're happy. Nine times out of 10, they're not. But Europe, 99% at least are going to be like nightmare. And one person will just not realize how dumb it was. It'll still have been a nightmare. They'll just be like, not willing to tell you. And she says, this proved to be a frustration. Uh, she says, you get different answers from different people to one simple question. Well, it's a stupid question. That's why you're getting different answers. Who are you asking this? You don't need to ask if you should bring a car. Don't bring a car. Uh, and if you don't like the answer, why do you keep asking different people? That's, we have a video that we did called being an asshole. Yes, if you keep asking, people will give up and start just trying to answer what you want to hear. They said you have to find, okay, then they had some stuff about healthcare. Now, I've used healthcare in France, it's been a while. For us, it was just walk in, done. Here, they're saying they couldn't find a doctor, they kept going, no doctor wanted to see them. Given their attitudes here, I wouldn't want to see them either. So if I was a doctor who had the option on this, I, I can see why I might have turned them down. This is very, they write, they, their pictures look like nice people, but the description in the CNN article definitely makes them seem really pretentious and rude Americans. And that's saying some, something when you go to France, who's kind of famous for being pretentious and rude. No offense to the French, they kind of, you know, they own it. They're like, no, we're pretentious and rude, it's cool. And you know what, it kind of is cool. It's their thing. 
They don't put up with any of the crap from the outside world. I like that. It's one of the reasons I kind of like going to France. I never have problems in France. I think it's wonderful. It's very nice. But yes, they're pretentious. They kind of earn it, right? You get to be pretentious when you have French bread and brie. But if you don't like that stuff, maybe you should rethink going to France. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just I can't with these people. Ah, she said every single every single day it was something more devastating than the day before. Things are very difficult to figure out here, so I'm too old for this. Okay, yes, you are retired. You are 75, and moving to a completely different culture that you don't like and have no interest in, and don't speak the language, and don't want to speak the language, and can't be bothered probably isn't a good combination. Um, you know, I, I, my father is 78. He would love to visit another country, live in another country, but imagining my father having to go to another country and needing to learn another language and figure out all the little intricacies of, of everyday life on his own, I imagine would be super frustrating. And not that he wouldn't want to, but at 78, it would be exhausting and, and frustrating. And he would feel panicked a bit. And I imagine this is happening here. Now, they're not alone. My father is single, so that would be worse. But like if my father moved here with support, he'd be like, this is so easy. This is great. Uh, now, she acknowledges, you know, she, that the, the real thing is just that in the U.S., she's used to how these things work. And in France, she's not. And so she's lost all the time. But they don't have the resources. They didn't make all the friends. They didn't take the long time to move in. They kind of jumped in all at once. And that has a tendency uh, to create problems. Now she says back in the US, she describes herself as a ch herself as a chatty box with an active social life, but she hasn't been able to replicate this or anything close to it in France thus far. Do you remember the bit where you didn't try to acclimate in any way and don't speak the language? That might be why people aren't talking to you. Um, she said that the found that the lack of socialization was having a huge impact on her. But remember, she couldn't be bothered. She was just too busy packing and unpacking. Another reason why you don't ship millions of things just to pack and unpack. I mean, I don't know how you unpack for a year, but okay. Aside from talking to people in the supermarket, she rarely has lengthy conversations with anyone but her husband now. The English speaker. Yes, we're not surprised. She hasn't, now she says, I haven't talked to one person here in three months. Uh, and she doesn't necessarily want to hang around with expat. That's not exactly why we came on this adventure. So they have some, they have some good attitude things in here, right? This is not all negative. I'm definitely taking it like th th just, these are really unprepared expats. Uh, she said the locals have been friendly and welcoming, but just hasn't managed to strike up friendships. Lacking the language will just do that. Now, it is true. The French basically all speak English. So um, there is, you know, the reality that you can go everywhere and hang out with them in English. But they don't tend to make friends that way, right? Especially if you're not making an effort. If it's a two-way street and they know English and you haven't learned French yet, but you are actively learning it and they were, they're helping you, very different, right? Um, but if you're just like, eh, you know, that's I like French and all. I just haven't... Uh, haven't prioritized it over this assembling furniture thing I've been doing for a year. You're, yeah. Um, it's a hard shell to break. They're very private people. Yeah, the south of France, It's this is going to be a tough area to just, you know, you're an outsider. Um, same thing here in Nicaragua. People are a way more, you know, like, it's not the same, but there, there's a, you got to get over this barrier of being like a complete outsider who just showed up and is not like making an effort to, you know, you're trying to learn the language, you're trying to be a part of society and blah, blah, blah. So if you treated Nicaragua the same way, you would find it a lot colder than it really is as well. Just like France is not this cold. The French are, you know, pretentious. They are cold, but not to the degree she's experiencing. Um, she also found, and I hope no one is surprised by this in my audience, that a lot of the socialization in Nimes, France, uh, seems to revolve around eating. Whoa! I mean, the French taking a strong interest in food as the center of socialization? That's, hmm, would never have called that. The next thing she's kind of mentioned is that they like wine sometimes. Uh, and then, oh, and then when you want to drink, you have to have a drink that's on the little menu that they make. If you want to have a martini, oh, it's not on the menu. 
That's how it is most of the world. You drink what's on their drink menus, right? This is Europe. Have you not been to Europe before? Like, what? Of course, the same thing in Nicaragua. We don't have ingredients for absolutely everything. It's not the United States. The United States has this wonderful cocktail culture. Okay, I don't talk about this enough. America has amazing cocktail culture. It's one of the things I miss most, and I don't know why I forget to mention it. I need to make a whole video on that, actually. Hold me to that. People pay attention. Get down in the comments. Ask me about my cocktail culture stuff. I'm a cocktail guy. My daughter, like, want, both of my daughters want to have speakeasy. They don't even drink. They just like the cocktail culture. And, you know, I love that. And I grew up in one of the cocktail cities, Rochester, New York. And I visited lots of cocktail places. I love cocktails in literature, in reality. I like really serious cocktails. I'm really into it. And it's something that I do miss that we have very little here. And, and anytime I travel, I try to, you know, if I'm going up to Guatemala or going down to Costa Rica, they have cocktail lounges that we don't have here. And so I try to go and I try to make an effort. And here in town, like I have one of the few places that will do cocktails in Sundance that I hang out with, uh, with some friends. They do cocktails, right? They do the best old fashioned in town. It's definitely weird. Very good. Um, and, uh, and, and everywhere in the world that I go, I'm always getting the local cocktails and trying stuff out. So I get that she wants a good martini. I, I love a martini. Now I can make a martini in the house. I don't need to go to a club. But you have, yeah, she's, she, this is just. <sighs> After struggling to feel completely at home in Nimes, they decided to relocate to Montpellier. Which is, uh, which is a city about an hour southwest, close, uh, it says, close to the Mediterranean coast. Where do you think Nimes is? Did they not, uh, whoever wrote this article didn't realize these were just down the coast from each other, but okay, closer to Barcelona. Uh, while they were initially rejected while trying to rent a new apartment, because they just didn't have their stuff together, they eventually got one. Uh, they prefer life in the bigger city. But they've come to the realization that it's just not the right country for them. She says she loves the country, which is great. Her attitude's good in places. And she thinks it's an amazing country just not to live here. Um, but this highlights the thing that I'm going to have in this video that I've already recorded, but I haven't put out yet. What is good to live for you and what is good to visit are very, very different things. And the chances that you will want to visit a place that you want to live is extremely low and vice versa. The nature of visiting a place being perfect essentially guarantees it won't be a good place to live. And for a place to be a great place to live means it will be terrible to visit. My favorite place to live in the United States is Dallas. It's a terrible place to visit. There's no reason to visit Dallas. Nothing. But to live there, it's a great city. As far as U.S. cities go, like it's very American, but it's... It, it's got great communities. It's very safe. It's got decent traffic, not, not great. It's got wonderful little communities that you would never guess with, with woods and streams and in the city, like beautiful stuff. It's got great architecture. Its prices aren't bad, at least not when I was last there. It, it's a really great city to live in. And you say, well, oh, we should visit it. And you'd be like, why? What would you do? Unless you're going there to live, what's the point? And that's what makes it great. But if you're going to Orlando, I would never never want to live in Orlando. But it's fun to visit. It's got a lot of fun stuff to do. It has attractions. So that's kind of... Now, to France is a little bit different. The thing that is the attraction, and it, the attractions of France, is almost all how people live because it's so different. But she basically says, oh, it's great to come and visit, see how people live, enjoy one meal, and then run away because she just wants to go back to being an American. Which is an important thing to recognize that, oh, I don't like not being an American. Maybe that's things that she needs to do. She doesn't want to learn a new language, so she should only be looking at places that speak English. She likes American food and shopping experiences and the way that Americans acclimate. And that is absolutely fine. If that's who you are, great. Enjoy your martini in California. San Francisco is not my style city whatsoever, but it is a great place to get cocktails. It does have neat cultural elements that I just don't personally appreciate, but I understand why other people would. And if that's the right mix for you, then fantastic. There you go. Enjoy California. Nothing's going to beat that for you. But um, it's... It's sad when you get to a point where you realize that your own country is not where you want to be, but you've never allowed yourself the flexibility to uh, explore another culture and be willing to give things up. Now, she says, 
Previously, she had been eager to leave the U.S. Now she misses her old life there desperately. She misses, and this is important, right? I miss familiarity. I miss knowing where things are. I miss frozen yogurt because they don't have it here. No one does. Frozen yogurt's an American food. It just is. She says, I miss stupid things. I miss my friends for sure. I don't know if she meant to point out that her friends were the stupid things, but we'll go with it. We don't have any family, but I have a great network of friends. I miss just being able to see them, and I miss my apartment. I think I just miss my life. I had one in San Francisco, and I don't have one here. And that is, and then she says, you know, if I was 30, this would be very different. I don't have a lot of time to waste, and so on and so forth. And, and that is all very, very true, right? And, and in the end, I think there's some really good points here that are worth people considering, is that they're one of the reasons that I love living outside my, my home country, the United States, is I specifically do not want familiarity. One of the things that actually bothers me most about Nicaragua is that I've become familiar with it, that it has a familiarity, not to the level the U.S. does, but it is no longer the exotic place that it used to be, obviously, that, that is the nature of uh, living in a place. Um, I know there are things like frozen yogurt that I'm going to give up, um, and uh, we talked about that on a live stream at length, and, and these things are... are you have to be okay. You have to be with, I'm going to give up all kinds of stuff. And I'm going to have a whole bunch of gallo pinto or, or baguettes and brie. And I need to be able to eat that. And I'm going to, martinis are not going to be the thing I drink all the time. I have to drink the things that the, the people there drink, whatever that is, and make these adjustments. And so for some people, that's not an adjustment they want to make. Some is they can't make. And some, it's fantastic. And some is just break even, right? Well, it's different. I put up with it. These are things you have to think about going anywhere is what are you going to give up and what are you going to be limited to? Then the same thing if someone was moved to the United States, they'd have all those same conversations in reverse. Oh, I'm giving up baguettes and brie, but <laughs> grilled cheese is fantastic, right? So it's a different, it's a different culture, it's a different place and you have to um, accept that those are things you're going to do. And some of them are going to be surprises and, and once in a while they're big surprises that really, really catch you when, when, especially Americans have a tendency to be like, wait, there's no frozen yogurt. This is a real one that comes up. People are really shocked that frozen yogurt isn't universal, but it's pretty uncommon the world over. People are unclear why Americans would eat that. They really like good, high-quality ice cream other places, and gelato, and things like that. And people who love gelato are like, who would want frozen yogurt when you have gelato? But I get it. I love frozen yogurt, too. I totally, totally get that. But familiarity and giving up your friends is huge, right? Um, for us and for a lot of people my age, um, and younger. I think we physically have given up our friends long ago. I gave up my friends 20, maybe 25 years ago because we all had to move in different directions. We all had careers and things. And, and yeah, we, we end up with new friends in new places. We have friends all over, but they all just keep moving. So, you know, we made a good group of friends in Dallas when we lived there for a long time and really good friends. And a few are still there. And if we lived there, we'd see them once in a while. But even there in Dallas, we live hours apart. And so, yeah, once in a while we get together at the bar. The one um, couple of people that we're really, really close to, like Kat, who's been on the show, and Rachel, who's been on the show, uh, one moved to uh, Nevada, one moved to uh, Belgium, right? And so even the people that we were closest to, that we made an effort to live right next to, and when we were there, all of us lived within a few minutes of each other, and we would see each other every day, now, if we had stayed, that wouldn't be the case. And that is so common at our ages. Now, at their ages, I think that's far less common. Um, you know, where my father is, he, a lot of people he knows are still there. A lot of moved, but a lot of them are still there. And um, so for us, moving to a new country did, did not require giving up a group of friends. And we worked really hard to acclimate when we got here. So we accumulated new friends. And because it's not the American culture of everyone moving all the time, our friends here are a larger group that is more stable than we ever had anywhere in the United States. When I was a child, or a very young adult, when I was 22, 23, we had a, a much more stable uh, worldview. I was the unstable one with a career that took me all over the place at the time. And, uh, but I was always able to go back to my home location, and my friends would be there and be able to hang out and stuff like that. So it's, uh, uh, it's been, um, I think, interesting to see definitely different groups have different reactions to things that to them going to someplace that's generally more social uh, left them without a friend group, but they didn't speak the language. Uh, but for us, moving to a place that was far away 
created opportunities for friends groups. Everyone's mileage is going to vary. Anyway, thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Link is in the notes as well. And as always, I will see all of you tomorrow.